As the Roman Empire was growing and expanding, one of the last Greek city-states to be like, we can stand up to the Romans, was Corinth. Well, guess what? No, you can't. And the Romans came into Corinth and wiped the place out. Either killed or expelled every single person in the city. It sat completely barren for 100 years. So when Paul shows up in 51, what you got to think is a new growth city, some sort of crazy mashup of like, New Orleans, Las Vegas, and Brooklyn. Sin City, Port City, blue collar soldiers and sailors who lived hard and sinned hard, worked hard, and, and you know, and you can get really, really rich there. Now, if you come to modern day Greece and, and we're hanging out, I live in Athens and we could drive over to Corinth. It takes about an hour and a half. Okay, it's not that far away. Corinth sits at an incredibly, incredibly interesting and hyper strategic location geographically. So if you look at a map of Greece, you sort of have the the main body of mainland Greece or the, this peninsula that runs from north to south. And it basically ends sort of at the Gulf of Corinth. And except there's this little bitty land bridge that sort of reaches out and then you have a thing called the, the Peloponnese, or the Peloponnesus, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which is almost an island, except for that little bitty land bridge comes across and, and grabs it. Corinth sits at the junction point of that land bridge in the Peloponnesus. What you can see, look at the map of that, is that a ship coming from Italy would leave Italy. And if it's trying to go, let's say, to Turkey, well, modern day Turkey, so um, at that time it would have been like the province of Asia, you know, for the Romans, that it would sail up the Gulf of Corinth, but then it would run into a dead end, which is that land bridge. And what they would do is they would offload the ships, they would haul their stuff across the land bridge, which I think is between three and six miles. I want to say it's maybe three miles across, but maybe it's mm -hmm. a little more than that. That's about right. They would haul all the stuff across. Reloads. Uh, they would often haul the ships themselves across. They actually had um, like a pulley system, mm -hmm. you know, set up where they could like actually sort of dry dock the ships. The alternative is that going sailing around the outside, which is more risky and yeah, time you, consuming. That's correct. You save about four hundred miles. That's significant by walking the three to six. Yeah, yeah. So and we and, got, we actually went up when we were there, and we went climbed up the little mountain. That's right. Stood on that edge. It's a little mountain. It's a couple thousand feet up there. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a bit of a. It's a I was a being hike. sarcastic a little bit. We got to drive up some of it. Yeah. And then and then we filmed over that edge, and you can actually see all of that. Oh yeah, yeah. You can see exactly why that was important, and so and then you just reload. They again they would often they would actually drag the ships. They'd empty the ships, ferry the cargo over, and actually drag the ships. It's almost like a. In, in a way, I think like a uh, roller coaster, you know, how you kind of have the mechanism that click, 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 and it can't roll backwards, you know. So now obviously they're using oxen and pulleys and mechanical advantage. They would actually haul the ships out over the, the little land bridge there poof, down into the, the Saronic Gulf on the other side, and then off they would go. But it's, so it's a connection point for the shipping, but it's also a connection point of overland traffic because if you're in northern Greece and you want to go to the Peloponnesus or vice versa, on foot, you have to pass there as well. So it's a connection point both for sailing and for land traffic. And so the Corinthians, you know, throughout all of history, uh, were quite wealthy uh, because of that. Now, there's a few things we want to explore, um, you know, and we'll get into the details of that in a minute. There's, but you got to know that in shifting from Athens to Corinth, you're going from Harvard to some sort of crazy mashup of like New Orleans, Las Vegas, and Brooklyn or something like that. You know, it's kind of like Sin City, Port City, you know, you're, again, you're going from the high minded and the, and the, the wise, the intellectuals mm -hmm. to blue collar soldiers and sailors who lived hard and sinned hard and worked hard and just, you know, it's a totally different thing. So the history on that is this. Um, as the Roman Empire was growing and expanding, uh, 146 BC, one of the last Greek city-states to be like, we can stand up to the Romans, was Corinth. 
Well, guess what? No, you can't. You can't send up to the Romans. And the Romans came into Corinth and wiped the place out. They either kill, they made it, they made an example of Corinth to the other Greeks. Either killed or expelled every single person in the city. Knocked down most of the buildings, with the exception of a few temples, and that was it. And Corinth sat completely, even though it was this amazing strategic location, it sat completely barren for a hundred years, for a century. Forty four BC. Uh, Julius Caesar gets looking around and he thinks that'd be a great place to found a city. And the, the Romans had a problem, which we mentioned in the Philippi episode, which they always had soldiers that if they completed their 20 years of service, we're supposed to get land. You don't want to put them in Italy because they'd be easy to call up and a, you know, a disgruntled general can try to gather them and they didn't like revolts like that. And so they always try to settle them outside of Italy. And so Corinth is set up as a Roman colony, revived in 44 BC. So when Paul shows up in 50 or 51, the city's really only been, been revived going, yeah. for less than 100 years, or right at 100 years. So it's a, what you got to think is a new growth city. It has been seated with, settled by soldiers, sailors, and dock workers. You know, you, you've left Harvard. You're in now. You're in working class, um, low brow town. Okay, nothing wrong with that. It's where I come from, you know. But it's not. It's not Harvard, you know. It's a. It's it's a rough and tumble. Now they're rich because it is in a low, in, in a great spot, and and the land's incredibly fertile agriculturally, and the fishing's good, and the, you know, and you can get really really rich there. And so it's a new growth city. It is booming. They're making a ton of money. Um, but even the money, it's not like old settled money. It's like nouveau rich, you know, like, you know, it's it's guys that were, you know, rednecks a generation ago. And then they got some money in their pocket, but they're not cultured. You know, it's that kind of people. Then you throw into the mix the fact that their chief goddess was Aphrodite, you know. So we talked about Athena and Athens. You know, in Ephesus, it's going to be Artemis when we get there. That's kind of money. Athena's wisdom. Corinth is sex. You know, now there's some argument as to what extent the cult of Aphrodite was functioning at the time of Paul. It was clearly at its heyday just before the destruction. You know, the question is, was it was it revived or not? Uh, I think it was and that it was functioning. Uh, maybe not to the same extent that it was it was previously, but we're not really sure. Um, what we do know is that Corinth had such a reputation for sexual impropriety that the word Corinth used in a verb form was the same as our current F word. So if you Corinth someone, you know, that's what that's, it meant. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, pretty good. And even Erastus, uh, the guy we mentioned who was a... A, a high uh, official in the city. In, his in the name city. means sexy. His name means sexy. Yes, they so were. They like, were all yeah, about we're it. all in. Our, our even our officials are named sexy. Yeah, oh yeah, they're all about it. And and um, also in the adjective form, you know, if you told somebody, "Oh, you act Corinthian," because it was a woman, they'd probably smack you because that means you're acting like loosely, you know, like a prostitute, something like that. Gotcha. So if you're like, oh, she's Corinthian, you know what I'm saying? You know, bam. <laughs> this is the way they spoke. That, yeah. you're, so so that's, that's, the, that's the reputation of the place. Yeah. Blue collared, bare knuckled, making money. You know, in a way, it's like, like Chicago 100 years ago or something, you know, when it was when Chicago was like a fast growth city and but it also had all the crime, you know, with the with Capone and all that. Uh, it, it maybe bears some similarity to that, you know, but it's also port city. That's why I said New Orleans earlier. You know, port cities tend to be sin cities because you've been on a boat for a few months, you're off the boat, it's party time. You know, you go all over the world, you know, whether it's New Orleans or San Francisco or Bangkok, Amsterdam, port cities have a, a reputation for also being sin cities. So it had that going on. That's the place Paul shows up to. Could not possibly be more different than Athens. OK. And as he's making that transition, Athens to Corinth, I think that's on his mind when he writes this to the Corinthians. This is in First Corinthians uh, near the back end of chapter one, like listen to this, how how he speaks to them. I think it's so great encapsulating. You know, we we talked about how Paul modulates his message to the audience. Like, listen to this. 
Uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness, those who are perishing, but is God's power to those who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will set aside the understanding of the experts. Okay, he's leaving Athens, full of the wise and the experts. And then he says this, where's the philosopher? He just got through talking to philosophers, Epicurean, Stoics, all those kind of guys. Where's the scholar? Where's the debater of this age? You know, you can, you, and you can tell like in his mind, he's pivoting, you know, He's kind of he's kind of still mad at Athens and away or like you know at what's going on there as, as he's you know he's beginning to address the Corinthians. Um, for since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of the message preached. You know, he's like you think this all sounds dumb, and, and in a way I think he's talking to the Corinthians and he's saying like yeah your neighbors down the road in Athens those high and mighty philosophers yeah. God's wisdom, God's foolishness is better than their wisdom. Ugh, those, where are the philosophers? Where are the, you, you can sense this pivot, yep. right? Um, God, for the Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. We talked about this a lot, you know, how Jews don't, don't believe in the incarnation. Gentiles don't believe in resurrection, so it's a problem either way. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom because God's foolishness is wiser than the human wisdom. He's like, don't worry about those, you know, puffed up dummies in Athens. God's foolishness is better than their wisdom. So forget that. He's is what he's telling the Corinthians here. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And then he kind of pivots. He's talking directly to the Corinthians. He says this, brothers. Consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective. He's like, you guys are kind of dumb. <laughs> you know, those guys in Athens are they're the smart philosophers. They missed it. You guys, you nobody's really calling you wise. You're a bunch of dock workers. You're a bunch of blue collar dudes, you know, not so much, you know, not so much in the worldly wisdom thing from a human perspective. Not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Again, he's talking to the city we talked about. It's all retired soldiers. It's 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 blue collar dudes. There's no nobility in Corinth, mm -hmm. you know. So instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So God's he, so Paul's kind of like he's working through you, you 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 guys that you know, they don't respect you. All those guys in the ivory tower up there, you know, you, you, they don't really respect you, but God is using you to show them. So he, like he, he, he gets it again. He gets his, his audience so that no one can boast in his presence. But it's from him that you are that you are in Christ Jesus, who became God given wisdom for us. You know, again, he's comparing, you know, the wisdom of man, you know, and then the the, the sort of the local uh, Corinthians is right. Some ways don't qualify. Our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. Flipping over to chapter 2, he says this, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I didn't think it was a good idea to know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, that's so interesting. A lot of times, preachers will read this, and they'll be like, see, you're not supposed to be smart. We're just supposed to be real simple and talk about Jesus. But that's not what Paul did. What he's saying is, when I showed up in Corinth, I looked around and I was like, ain't nobody got a college degree around here. This is not that audience. This is the keep it simple audience. Okay. Now you could say then, well, is he like insulting them? Is he kind of like talking down to the Corinthians, calling them a bunch of idiots? No, because read that, that previous statement was like, God is using what this world calls foolish to prove that its wisdom is foolish, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what the, and, and he's saying what the world calls. So I think, I think he's, he's reinforcing his Corinthians. He let them know, like, like God thinks highly of you. You're not, you're not dumb, but those high and mighty types think you're dumb, but God's using you. You know, but then, but then he says, but let's be honest, if I'd have come to you with, with the same lecture I gave on Mars Hill, you would have been like, huh, who's Eretus? Never heard of Eretus. You know, this poet you're quoting and, uh, and what, huh? Unknown God. Wait, wait, you're losing this, Paul. You're like, so I didn't use that message. I just used a real simple 
gospel presentation. Jesus crucified when I came to you. I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith may not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. But do you, you, do you hear, okay, now we'll pivot to the, to the Acts account, but you, you kind of hear him talking to them and explaining what went down you know, in Corinth, mm -hmm. that, that God's power showed up. But but the message was, man, I just kept it simple because that's kind of who it was. And, and you hear Paul's like almost disgust, his derision of, you know, like quote unquote human wisdom, this this wisdom that's not founded on God, that, you know, that these so-called, you know, high and mighty types in Athens are espousing. And he's like, you know, you can almost get that. And what's funny is that's like today, too, right? I mean, a lot of times in Christian circles, one of the refrains that you get is like, oh, you know, the ivory tower types in, um, you know, the East Coast elites, you know, in, in New York and in Harvard and places like that. Like they don't get it, but we do, you know, but you, you, you still have a, a thread of, of that kind of refrain, I think, that, that echoes in, in Christianity uh, till now. Now, not, not again, not that I don't think that Christianity works. It's not like we well, got to be real dumb to be a Christian. Like, no, no, that's, that's not what we're saying at all. You know, and, and even biblically, you had people from that top class that, that did come to faith. Like we talked about uh, Dionysus, the Areopagite, which he would have been the, the leaders of the Brainiacs in Athens, mm -hmm. you know, did come to faith. Um, but culturally, I do think sometimes uh, what, what I think at the end of the day is the truth is this. In order to come to Christ— you have to get to a point where you are broken, where you realize, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. If you just leave me to me, I'm going to screw up my life. Therefore, I want to hand it over, you know, to the Lord. And, you know, people that have something else to lean on, whether that's their own intellect or maybe it's a lot of money, whatever, then that's, you, then I think it's sometimes harder for people in those camps to come to Christ because it's kind of just harder for them to get to that place where, you know, you know, like the, the Beatitudes talks about where you're poor in spirit, where you realize I don't have anything to offer. You know, you think you do have something to offer because you're so smart, you know, and which leads to pride, which keeps you away from God. So it's not that being smart is bad or being educated is bad. Paul is smart and educated and could come to people with words of great wisdom and power. He, he had that capacity and used it from time to time. But, you know, I, I think the word to the wise in this is, you should know it comes from God. It should go back to him. True wisdom would be to understand that the reason you're smart is because you were given a gift, not because you earned it, you know, and, and that you, it should, you should, that should still be couched in humility which, you know, obviously I think the people he's sort of talking bad about here, that's who it is. But anyway, I think that frames nicely the pivot uh, to Corinth. Yeah. Oh, and there's a discussion, too, if it's uh, I don't know if we've talked before, but you and I have at least about the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. You know, and the, the biblically, you know, like wisdom is, is like maybe, you know, some knowledge mixed with discernment. Right. Mixed with some theology. Uh, but the, and philosophy, but then, you know, that's wisdom. Well, knowledge might just facts don't equal necessarily right no. choices. No, and biblical wisdom, which is, I think is why Paul uses this disclaimer, the wisdom of the disclaimer, the wisdom yes. of men. Right. You know, what we would say regarding biblical wisdom is what the Bible says in the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, the fear of God's being wisdom that, you know, a, a true wisdom starts with a knowledge of reverence toward you know, quote, unquote, again, fear of God. That's not fear like he's going to zap me, but it is, it is fear in that it's respect, mm -hmm. you know, and it's an awe or reverence or, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I gave, I, I, I spoke in a church uh, a couple days ago and I was, you know, talked about Elijah and it says about Elijah that he, you know, Elijah is standing before Ahab and Jezebel who could have killed him in a snap of their finger. He says, you know, the God before whom I stand, and what, what Elijah is saying there is like, okay, so I'm in the court of this evil king and queen. You know, they, they kill 
few people before breakfast most days. You know, my life's on the line. But what I realize is I'm not standing before Ahab and Jezebel. I'm standing before God. I have a sense of him being in the room. And that I care more what he thinks about what I'm about to say than I care what you think about what I'm about to say. You know, that's a godly wisdom that fears God, that, that understands. Yeah, this person sitting across from me. But also God's right here. And I, I care more that he's happy with the next word I'm about to say than this person across from me. It's, I don't want to be offensive or ugly to anybody, but I care more that God is pleased with what I do the next few minutes, you know? So I think that's the difference. It's it, the, the godly wisdom has that measure in it. It's a knowledge, a knowledge of God. And if you have a knowledge of God, you're not going to be arrogant because you're going to know whatever gifts you have, whether they're it's music or athletics or, or knowledge or whatever it was given to you. You didn't, you didn't come, you didn't originate with you, you didn't earn it, you know? So therefore you should, you should carry it with a certain amount of humility. that says, what, what am I supposed to do with this? How do, how do I give it back? Not, you know, how do I exploit it to abuse people to grow my own power base? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there you go. Cool. There's, there's our aside on human wisdom as compared to the, the stuff that Paul was deriding. Yep. So here's what happens in Corinth. Now we did separate episodes on the Erastus stone and on the Delphic inscription. So. If you're like, huh? You want to touch on them? Yeah. So just quickly, I, I don't want to, we don't have, if we go into that, I'll take a whole other hour and that's not what we're doing We did today. videos on them and, and I'll link to them in this video if you want to go explore them. Yeah. So here's what you have to know. We have two rocks. You know, the Bible talks, the rocks will cry out and sometimes the rocks really <laughs> cry out in our part of the world. And, and we found two uh, regarding this story that really cried out. One uh, names the Roman governor, which later Luke is going to name, you know, governor of Achaia. And and that stone was found in Delphi. Uh, the Roman emperor, I think it was Tiberius, is like, hey, thanks. I think it's Gallio. Or we'll get down to a read in a second. Is Gallio. Hey, yeah. Hey, Gallio. Proconsul thanks of for Achaia. serving well as the proconsul of Achaia in the, and it names the year of his reign, in the 12th year of my reign or something like that. It sort of gives the year. And, and since that was a one-year appointment, then we can know since Paul, you know, Paul's service ends during that, then we can, we can, we know that Paul's time of service in Corinth, he was, and he was there for a year and a half. It ended in like 51 or 50. Then you go back from there and you get his arrival date. So he arrives in like basically 49 or 50, I think is kind of how it works out, <laughs> um, you know, give or take. So that's amazing. So the, Luke, the, yeah, both of those things are probably significant reasons why. First and second, second Corinthians are attributed as definitely written by Paul by the most critical scholars. Yeah, hey, absolutely. No one, no one questions Corinthians. And, and as a side, a side, I may have another video about this that we we have on our channel. But people were critical of the New Testament and the manuscripts and whatnot, and what was written and what was real and what's true. Paul is like. Is not is not argued against. Maybe certain letters. Oh, Paul didn't write those because they don't fit with his style or whatever. But at least seven of them are. He's so trustworthy because of things like this yeah. that you just cannot deny that he had an experience with the risen Jesus. No, and you had you can't deny he's a real person. You can't deny he didn't write, know all these people and went and did all this stuff and taught this stuff. So these oh, are, no. they're really important. No, even skept even skeptical scholars will be like, yeah, there was one guy named Paul. He really did have a vision. We think it was, you know, bad pizza or drugs or, <laughs> right. you know, he, uh, he, yeah. a heat stroke or, you know, they're, they're going to give some other reason for it. But yeah, but it's not real. But they'll, yeah, he, he did. And that changed his life. And then therefore he did these things. You know, yeah, I, exactly. You yeah, can't I, deny it. Yeah. So no, no. Paul, but the, so there's that one. Then there's the other stone too. So yeah, the other one is it, basically there's a stone that references a guy named Erastus. Erastus is mentioned three times in the New Testament. Uh, I forget all exactly which ones. Mr. The, the, the end of Romans. Yeah, is the main one. Um, there's a couple. It says Erastus, the the city treasurer. Mm -hmm. He's referred to as later. He's referred to as Erastus, my helper. You know, like he's my assistant. Yeah. You know, and here's what you have to know about that. 
So they found a rock and it basically just says, hey, this was put here by Erastus at his own. Ex- Erastus, the tr- city treasurer, it's in, it's in Latin, not Greek. So it's slightly different. It's like a deal, but it, it has the same meaning. So he put this here at his own expense. Well, OK, so he, he, what we know about city treasurers is they basically had to be one of either the richest guy in town or at least one of the top two or three. Um because the Romans had this idea, which I think is actually a really dumb idea, but whatever, which was that rich people don't steal. They already have money. Why would he need to steal? You know, uh, some poor guy would steal. Rich guys, no way they would ever steal. So they typically trusted the city money to somebody who was rich. OK, it was an elected position, uh, which means he was very well liked by the town. And so you, you kind of can, can build a, a bit of a um character, I guess, or yeah. Erastus was. You sort of start to extrapolate what he was probably like. But here's what you have to know is that while Corinth was a new growth city, it was still like, if not the richest, it was maybe second place. You know, or basically the two richest cities in the empire were Corinth and Ephesus. Corinth was rich because of all that traffic. There's a reason people were moving in and over 100 years it exploded in population, which because you could make a, it's the same reason the American West exploded. You could make a ton of money in Corinth. And so the richest guy in Corinth is probably one of the three or four richest guys in the empire. This is this is Bill Gates, Elon Musk level wealth. Okay. Erastus is rich. And he becomes part of Paul's entourage. And the, and the stone really confirms it because you have the, it's the same name, right location, same job, also right time. It's, it's been confirmed to be middle of first century, both the stone and the inscription. So... But we know it's the same Erastus also because of the job because the name was like hyper rare, right? So and we covered all that in, in great length. But basically, his name means sexy. It's derived from Eros, Eros, Erastus. Um, and, and because it's such a kind of a weird name, it's never used anywhere else in Greek literature. There is no other reference to a man whose name was Erastus ever in any Greek literature. There's a maybe two instances where it talks about somebody else who was kind of like Erastus was kind of like their nickname. You know, but never like their actual name. They would put on it's like inscribed on a stone in stone yeah. in the middle of the city. Yeah. So so his name was basically sexy, which is crazy. Like, you know, you, your your mm. your son, you know, pops out and you're like, what are you going to name him? And you're like, John, Matthew, Erastus, sexy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's what they did. All that's just to say we, we can really with the archaeological evidence, we can lock in this time. And we can lock in the fact that the Bible is telling us true things about who came to faith there. Okay. So there's some background too. All right. And I think this is one of the reasons why I feel like sometimes critical scholars like to attack Paul because they can't attack him historically. So you have to attack what you have to twist what Paul believed and his experience yeah. was when he saw Jesus. Was it really like that? And Paul was just trying to, he was against Peter and he was trying to, his version of Christianity was just for Gentiles and, and he had his own gospel and they, and it's yeah. like, the, it becomes this like conspiracy theory because Paul's so historically reliable. Significant. Yeah. So just, you know, well, and you know, to use the Tom Holland quote, he's a, he's a, an atom bomb in history. He just, yeah. boom, you know, Paul just blows up every, everything. But I know? think that's one of those things that's super interesting because it's actually so, it's, it's so uh, reliable and relevant that mm-hmm. like you just. And, it, and if he was outside the core of Christ, Christianity, then you would have somebody like a Peter or a James who all knew him. Yeah. Who would refute him. Right. Instead, you have Peter saying like, he's real complex. But he's good. He's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, Peter, you can tell he's a fisherman talking about a philosopher. And he's like, yeah, this stuff he writes is hard to understand. It's a little hard to wrap your head around. But, yeah, he's good. He's one of us, you know. So they don't refute him. He's 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 in the main line of of what everyone's believing. And and he's you know, he's down with the death, you know, death, resurrection, deity of Christ. Clearly, clearly. Burial, too. Yeah. And, and what these guys will say is at a certain level that like, well, you know, like, like regarding deity, for instance, or like he's not clear about that. And to be fair, he, he's not as like sledgehammer clear about deity as like John is. You know, John is like in the beginning of the word, the word was God. Did you get that sentence, guys? Was God. You know, and, and he re- reiterates that in his in his epistles as well. So, you know, John needs us to hear that you know paul with paul it's a little bit less overt but it's still there you know so yeah people will try to like drive these wedges between him and and the 
I guess what we would consider mainline Christianity, but no, nah, it's all, it's all nonsense. So and don't and, believe and it. while we're in Corinthians, you know, you have like Paul's reference in first Corinthians 15 to you know, one of the most famous creeds. It, he kind of tags it with his own experience, mm-hmm. you know, but that's, we actually touched on that in another video where we explored, um, the, that is kind of like the earliest, the uh, high Christology is early evidence, which yeah. is more like a Gary Habermas argument mm-hmm. when he goes through all of the creeds. But that one, it's really interesting because this is to this same group right here. Cause I guess they were arguing over the resurrection. And so that's called like the resurrection chapter or whatever first you know, sure. Corinthians 15. So he's kind of going through and to further connect Paul to Peter and, and the other disciples he's saying, what this early creed was, you know, Jesus died according to the scriptures, buried, raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He was seen by the twelve. And oh yeah, yeah, for James, sure. James and and he kind of un, unpacks it all, and then he says, and as the one I've normally born, it also appeared to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it, it's an interesting like piece of evidence for. That, high, he, that early, he was a standard Christian. He was and a standard and had Christian a high Christology. and had high Christology. So I thought that was. I yeah, and you can't drive awesome. a wedge between him and the others, which yeah. people, people really want to do. But we actually explore that whole thing in another video if anyone wants to check it out. And I'll also put that in, in, in the description as well. All right. So let's get into what happens. So after this, so after Athens, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So there was some sort of an uproar in Rome, and periodically, you know, the Jews kind of got used as punching bags and moved around. And so they are like, get out, you know, the emperor orders them all to get out. It says, and Paul came to them, and being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to pay both Jews and Greeks. So what you got to know here is because some some of you might think like, well, if you're in a big city, why do you need tent makers? That sounds dumb. The reason you need tent makers is, okay, first off, as a tent maker, you can also repair sales, which that was plenty of that going on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Secondly, is there is very, very strong historical evidence that uh, there were games. I think they're called the Isthmian Games. So... Um, you know, the Olympics, of course, the Olympian games have, have come down to us as something we really, you hear that and you're like, oh yeah, I know that. That's like the, you know, athletic stuff. But the second most important games after, after the Olympian games were the Isthmian games, the Isthmus, the, you know, the land bridge games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and those were celebrated, you know, if we can date him the 50, 51, they were celebrated while he was there, which means there would have been tens of thousand people camped around the city for the games who all would have needed tents. It would have been a great time to sell a tent in Corinth. So uh, there, there is plenty of of uh, of ways to to argue that, but some people have challenged like that's dumb. Why is he making tents in a big city? Well, here's why: it actually it ends up that Corinth would be one of the best places in the world mm-hmm. uh, to make and sell tents. Yeah. So, so there you go. So he's doing that. Um, he ordered all the Jews from Rome free. Paul came to them and, being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. So Paul always would go to the Jews first. This is not because he's a racist. It's because he's getting low-hanging fruit. People that already knew a lot of the scriptures, and he was hoping he could nudge them a little farther, just like he had been, you know. And this is another piece of evidence. It's like you hear critical views on Paul, and it's like he was just trying to create. He had his own gospel, which was the Gentiles. I'm like, yeah, but. It says right here when he, he goes to the, the he Jews. Always, he always every, does. Every time. Yeah. So you can't say that he was only for Gentiles. That's correct. It just doesn't. It's like you're not reading the text. You're just taking it out of context. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching the message uh, and solemnly testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook his robe and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, that's pretty serious, you know, yeah. but Paul is saying, like, if you reject the Messiah, you know, like, you know, again, sometimes as Christians, we don't want to talk about the fact that, you know, we want to be all, all grace and mercy and love and, and absolutely. But at the end of the day, there is a price to pay for rejecting Christ. And so Paul is like, okay, fine. You've been warned. I'm moving on. Mm-hmm. And so, and so he leaves. Um, he's, I'm just from now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to, he didn't go far though. 
and went to the house of a man named uh I, I hate this dude's name because it's just it's tedious justice. Um, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he just goes next door. And he's like, I'm leaving. where well, you can find me. I'll <laughs> be next door. right outside. Go next door. Oh, we keep talking about the rocks. Yeah. We absolutely know there was a Jewish community in Corinth. And we know there was a synagogue because we found uh, stones with the, the menorah carved into them. Mm-hmm. They cannot positively ID the, the synagogue yet mainly because only about maybe eight or 10% of Corinth has actually even been excavated because modern people live there as well. So you can't just be digging up people's houses, you know, but we know there was a synagogue because we found evidence of that. You know, we've, again, you don't, you don't have menorahs carved into things just at random. That's, that's not a thing that would happen. And there's even, even some word inscriptions regarding the Jewish community in the synagogue. And there's a like cool that. little museum there on site. Of that's Angel exactly Corinth. right. Is it, it in there? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's right in the courtyard there. So if you're going to go, you right. go check it out. Um, all right. So next one, the synagogue, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue believed, uh, the Lord along with his whole household and many of the Corinthians when they heard believed and were baptized. So Paul has great early impact there. A lot of people come to faith, but that stirs jealousy. But then this happens. It says, then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent for I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in the city and he goes on to say, and he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now, this is what I want you to think about. You don't tell someone, don't be afraid, unless they're afraid. That's what we can derive from that. We can derive from this the fact that Paul had was afraid. He was worried. Paul had been arrested and beaten before it, by this time. You know, for sure in... Uh, uh, Philippi as well mm-hmm. other places that are already recorded in the early, earlier in the Acts account. So he'd already received three or four beatings by this point. And he knows that that's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to be beaten with rods and whips to the point that your back is laid open, maybe even bones exposed. And by this time, he may already have injuries that would haunt him the rest of his life from those things, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of, the Bible kind of implies he kind of looked rough, you know? And... um he talks about a thorn in the flesh. We have really no idea what that meant, but it possibly it possible it was an injury that he had sustained, you know? So so he doesn't want to get beat again. I don't blame him for that. And and, and what I like about that whole thing where, where God kind of comes to him and says, like, Hey, don't be afraid, keep keep going, is the fact that like sometimes we view these guys as like superheroes. They're amazing. They have so much faith and conviction. They're just like, Rawr. Like, no, Paul's real. He talks about, I came to you with fear and trepidation. I was worried. You know, he's like, I really want to go there witness, but man, I don't want to get beat again. I don't, you know, like, yeah, this, but oof, I don't want to get thrown in jail. That's not any fun. You know, he was a real person. You know, he he, he talks about in 2 Corinthians, he talks about like, man, my whole ministry in Macedonia, I never had any rest. It was always a conflict without, fear within, and this and that and the other. Oof, that was tough. So I just think for us, there's a, a bit of encouragement in knowing that, like, you know, if, if you're trying to do the right things and you're just feeling kind of beat up and you're in your worry and you're scared, you're well, you're in good company. You're in the company of Paul, you know, who did good things and was scared to death as, mm-hmm. as he moved forward, you know, of what the consequences were going to be. And, you know, and I don't know if you want to use the word scared, but certainly anxious, uh, certainly I mean, Jesus in the garden is is literally sweating blood yeah, because he's so distraught at what's going to happen the next day. So it's okay to be not okay. Yeah. You know, so I, I like that, that God, you know, gives him that encouragement. It lets me know that I'm okay if I'm upset about something. But another well, thing that I find interesting, go ahead. I was say, are we about to get to, I was going to say, see now for, we're about to get to the, 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 Ga- the Galio thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, the Bema, which we filmed that as well. But now he's going to be like four for four with like being brought before people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because like he literally is like Philippi, Thessaloniki yeah, yeah. as well too, right? That's where they yeah, say yeah. you're turning the world upside down. Yeah, that's right. And then he goes to Athens. He gets hauled up there. Now ah, he comes yeah. here. He gets pulled. No, this guy gets in trouble wherever he goes. <laughs> I'm like, dude, come on, man. Yeah, he's, right. he's, a, he's a troublemaker. But um, this is this too. It says, God says, kind of don't be worried. You'll get hurt because I have many people in this city. And I always say that interesting. 
they're in Sin City. Again, they're in New Orleans mixed with Las Vegas, mixed with whatever else, you know. And God's like, you know what? Well, you're a secret. I got a lot of people here. Like, really, God, in this crazy place with 1,500 prostitutes coming down the mountain every night and, you know, all the crazy sexual perversion. I got dudes sleeping with their mother-in-laws and all the, like, in this loony bin, you got a lot of people. Yeah, I got a lot of people here. It's so interesting. You know, like sometimes our evaluations are not accurate, you know. And so with that encouragement, Paul's like, okay, for a year and a half, he pushes and he witnesses and he founds a church. He founds a crazy church. You know, you read through first and Corinthians, they had a lot of issues, but nevertheless, they were big and they were growing and they were effective and they were doing good things for the Lord. And, and then it comes to a head like this. It says, while well, Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. Okay. It's the guy we mentioned who's, who, whose existence was attested to by the inscription found in Delphi. The Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench, which is often called a bema. Okay. So the bema at Corinth is this big giant, it's like a platform or a stage almost. And the Roman governor would stand up and his feet were about 10 feet off the ground. So as the man being judged, you know, when you go into an American courtroom, the judge is, you know, maybe a foot elevated, you know, maybe less. He's a little bit elevated. So you have the idea that the judge is a little bit above you being symbolized there. But in Roman times, the judge was way above you. You were looking up at his feet because they're making a point. We're the imperial Roman you know, authority. We can crush you. We can kill you. We. This is not a democracy. So what are you, what are you here for? And we're going to hear this case and we're going to wreck somebody. You know, they, this was not uh, human rights and, you know, you, the police officer was mean to me when I got arrested or, you, you know, the judge was like, no, they didn't care about any of that stuff. Okay. They were making a point about power. We have it. You don't. You're down there. We're up here. What's going on? What you further have to know is w- when you go there and you stand on the ground and you look up at that platform. Just next to you over to your left is a a block of stone. That block of stone has a borehole in it. And what the archaeologists tell us is that tells us there was a bolt in that stone and that there would have been chains attached to that bolt and that a prisoner that was sentenced to a beating, you know, okay, now you're going to be flogged. It wasn't like you're going to be flogged now go back to jail, sit there for several months while you, you know, have an appeal and all. no, 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 no. You're getting flogged right now. And so, so Paul is standing there. Here's the stone with the chains hanging from it. And he knows if this goes bad, he's going to be chained to that stone. And it's, it's kind of about this high. So you kind of like lay over it while you're chained to it this way. You kind of like hug it basically. And, and you, as you could curl over it and you'd have been stripped naked and then beaten mercilessly. And it's the kind of beating that again, by the time it was over, you'd have been bleeding from multiple lacerations all over, you know, the backside of your body, mm-hmm. uh, possibly with even like bone and, you know, some stories talk about even organs exposed. Okay, horrific beating. Mm -hmm. When you get that kind of beating, it doesn't matter how strong or tough a man you are, you're going to cry and beg for mercy. You're also going to lose control of your your bodily functions, you know, your bowels and your bladder. And we don't know how many people had been tried that day. You know, this is a day when the court is in session, when the, the governor is here and he's hearing cases. And it is likely that as Paul is waiting, somebody else got a guilty and got beaten there. You know, I, I would certainly say that, that that stone, that pedestal would have been covered in blood and whatever else had been left behind by the previous victims. And so you're Paul and you're standing there and you're looking at this thing. And you're looking at this judge who has all the power in the world over you. This is a tough moment. This is not... Uh, 
small claims court in your local you know, small town. This, this is a lot on the line right here. This is a big moment. And here is what happened. So they say, this man persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of a crime or moral evil, it would be resp- reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. Romans didn't like Jews too much, just so you'll know. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourself. I don't want to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the judge's bench. Then they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. So instead of Paul getting beaten, Sosthenes gets beaten. But none of these things concerned Gallio. Gallio's like, I don't care. Now, there's a couple of things that are worth noting here. Paul writes letters to all kinds of churches. Philippi, Thessalonica, Ephesus. In virtually all those letters, and I don't say all of them, but but in the, the majority of them, and maybe, I don't say all, but the, the vast majority of them, he talks about persecution. Hang in there. You know, your, your, your testimony is proof that your opponents are going to lose and you're going to win and, and you're going to receive new life and, and they're going to receive judgment and it's okay. And, and, you know, you're doing great. I'm so proud of you. There's all this encouragement regarding um, abuse, you know, and persecution. Paul writes two really, really long letters to the Corinthians, never mentioned persecution, not even one time. Interesting. Now, I can't prove this. This is how it happened in my head, okay? And it's possible this is what happened. It's also possible it didn't. But if the richest guy in town has become a believer and he's serving as assistant to Paul, you got to know he's got access to the highest levers of power. I mean, Elon Musk can talk to Joe Biden. You know, the, the, if you're the richest guy, you can get people on the phone. And my guess is, if I have to guess and conjecture here, and this is conjecture, I'm making an argument from, from a, a little bit of information and a whole lot of, uh, uh, of silence. Yeah, I, you know, maybe Erastus went to Gallio beforehand and was like, because because God said, "Don't worry, I got a lot of people." Wink, wink. You're gonna be fine. Somebody went to Gallio, I think, and was like, "Hey, this Paul thing, this needs to go away." And he's like, "All right." So the Jews show up and and he's just like, get them out of there and beat them too. And by the way, this is an internal affair among the Jews. This is super important. Mm -hmm. So because, see, in in ancient Rome, you had to worship the emperor. Mm -hmm. Okay. You had to go to the site of emperor worship, where that's a temple of, of like Augustus, later Domitian, but you had to go to these places and offer sacrifice to the emperor. Well, Christians aren't willing to do that. Like, I'm not going to That's what got them in trouble later. Yes. Right, yeah. Is that they wouldn't. Now, the Romans had made a special exemption for Jews that if you're a Jew, because they knew Jews would never do this either, and they don't have to go around and kill, you know, millions of people. It would be inconvenient to do that. You'd lose their labor and the ability to exploit them for money. So we want to keep them alive. So what are we going to do? Okay, for you Jews, here's an exception. You can pray for, not to the emperor. And so that's what Jews did. They gave a sacrifice to Yahweh, to their God, and prayed for, but not to the emperor, which is fine. As a Christian, I do the same. I pray for our governing officials, right? Okay, fair enough. What Gallio does here is he defines Christianity as an internal affair amongst the Jews. So the governor from Rome, who's friends with the emperor, says all this stuff here about Paul's teaching that all counts as an internal inter-Jewish thing. And the Roman government is out. And I think because of that ruling that the Christians in Corinth were able to live under that umbrella pretty comfortably for a fairly long time to come, that they didn't really endure some of the persecutions that maybe happened other places. And by the way, that same exemption, Christians definitely claimed it like, no, we're, we're doing that. We're on that. You know, later again, you know, some guys would be like, "Mm, no, 
you know, a couple hundred years later, when there were lots and lots of Christians, it was hard for them to really say, yeah. you know, we're we're a sect of Judaism. You know, they're, you know, the Romans eventually kind of rejected that D- that Domitian argument. Was like the bad. He's the, the big worst. bad one who yeah. who basically systematically goes throughout the whole empire and makes everyone come to a sacrifice to the emperor or a pagan god, yeah, you know, or face horrific, mm-hmm. you know, uh, persecution. Yeah, he, he's that's but that's a almost three hundred years later, well, two hundred fifty years yeah. later, let's say. So that, that that's a, a bit later in history, but yes, eventually the Romans become very systematic about finding Christians and enforcing, you know, that you do these sort of pagan rites. Mm-hmm. Um, at this time, it's not like that, and I, I think this is a, a really important event that took place. Um, again, I can't de- cannot prove that Erastus like went to to Gallio and like like rigged the trial. No, yeah, but in my head, that's how it happened. Yeah. Um, but but what is what I do think is clear is that by Gallio Gallio making that statement. That now it's mm-hmm. that's the umbrella they lived under for it definitely, a while. Yeah, it definitely explains that. That makes sense. So okay, so so that's what happened. Um, kind of wrapping up, but but just something. It's hard to mention Corinth and not talk about this. Uh, if you read through the letters, you know Paul will come back to Corinth again. He writes them, but we think four times. We have two of those letters. Um. You know, we talked about the Greek paganism, you know, what are you worshiping? Again, in, in Corinth, it is clearly sex, and they had a ton of problems. So, you know, it's almost hard to mention it without mentioning that because it's just kind of who they were. Um, you know, Paul talks a lot to them, you know, you just sort of reprimand certain things, you know, like, you know, we, we have him in writing saying, you should not sleep with your mother-in-law, you know. Oh, okay. She says, he actually is your father's wife. So you, you can assume that the father had, you know, divorced or the wife died and remarried. And some guys like, I don't, you know, acting crazy. And Paul's like, no, Christians can't do that. Okay, fair enough. And he's telling them not to sleep with prostitutes because prostitution was absolutely uh, you know, endemic. Everybody did it in the town. So so as Christians coming to faith, they you can imagine they're not Christian culture people. They don't know. They're coming out of this and they're like, what? We can't do that anymore? Really? Okay. You know, um, and it, it's also worth ar- noting that that Paul in his writing is talking about uh, about sexuality is really the first person who says, you know, to be a you know, he, he talks about how to, to be a, a Christian leader, you should be a one woman man. You know, like in, in his statement that, you know, really the only acceptable view for sex in the context of a marriage, you know, the, the one man, one woman for life ideal of Christianity he is the first one to articulate that. Up until then, men had sex with anyone under them, male or female. In the Greco Roman world, all that mattered was position. You know, anyone who lived or worked in your home, full access. And he comes along and says, mm, that's not okay. We're not going to do that. You know, you, you would never have had a trial for pedophilia in the Roman world. You never have had a trial for like a Me Too kind of thing. And Paul comes along and says, yeah, that's not love. You know, we, we, we live by love. And I think it's so interesting that to these people who were rough and tumble and they were, you know, they were kind of mean. You know, they, they in Second Corinthians, he's like, I know that you think I'm ugly and a bad speaker, you know, because they were saying that. He's like, you say I'm ugly, bad speaker, but my writing's good, you know, but I love you guys. And let me tell you. So so they were mean to him. You know, they're acting crazy. Uh, and they don't they, they worship the God of love. But what they really mean is sex and possession. I have you. Um, that's who he writes the love chapter to love is patient. Love is kind. doesn't envy. doesn't boast. Like he's like, let's redefine that. And, and so I, and I think that you cannot possibly overemphasize, um, Paul's redefinition of, of what Christian love marriage monogamy, uh, should look like. Cause it was really, really novel in the world at the time. And so that, that's also just, you cannot leave Corinth without, you know, mentioning that. No, I think that's great. I really love it in that in that context. I mean, I it's um it's funny that you said that he's like you say I'm not a good speaker. I'm sure to them he probably wasn't a good speaker. You know, sometimes I listen to like really like heady lectures from intellectuals. Yeah. And I'm like, this person's not a good speaker. But to heady intellectuals are like, that was brilliant. You know, yeah. so I, maybe that's what's going on. He wasn't on. quite their audience. I think he's 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 pretty he did a pretty good job on Mars Hill. Um, in speaking yeah. <laughs> to them, maybe he wasn't. Um, yeah, it's really interesting thinking about all that stuff in the context, thinking about 
how he writes to them too. It almost seems like so, um, I mean, I, I he's gives gentle, them, gentle. He, yeah. I was just going to say gentle. It's like in a way and he's it's kind like, and patient hey guys don't like sleep with your mother-in-law. It's bad. Okay. Um, you know, and stuff, different things, you know? So, um, I think that's really interesting. We well, talks about like, you shouldn't be united to a, a prostitute because you're the temple of God. Like, yeah. The Holy spirit lives in you. Yeah. You know, that temple up there doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, the God lives in you, not in those places. And, and you need to treat your body in, in accordance. Well, these are all radical thoughts. Yeah. Like, really, really radical. Like no one ever said those things before. Yeah. You know, so I, I you know he, you know, what you have to about that town, about that town was they would give girls to the temple. Yeah. Right. You know, slave girls often, daughters occasionally, you know, you want to give you as a tribute to the temple to go serve as a prostitute in the temple, as a priestess, you know, and mm-hmm. to have sex with passersby as a form of worship, you know. So in a place that was doing that, he comes and is like, no, it's not OK. Let's talk about what this is supposed to look like. So I think that's really important as well. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, so that's that's Corinth. Um and then what do we, so we're going to wrap up next episode? Yeah, we're, wrap, we're going to wrap up with Ephesus. Okay. Um, There's a lot to, there. To me, Ephesus, yeah, Ephesus is Paul's last best work. He's older. It's later in his career. It's the last church he plants. And um, I feel like it's his master class, if you would. Here's how you do it. Yeah. And so I, even though we've really followed that second missionary journey, you know, and Ephesus is actually planted later, I just don't think I could leave Paul behind. Uh, without talking about what he did in Ephesus. So we're going mm-hmm. we're to do Ephesus last, and then we will move on to, to new topics. I loved when we went to Ephesus, and we did three episodes there, so I'm interested to see how we get it into one episode on this podcast. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, click like and subscribe. It really helps us. And if you really enjoyed it, go on over to our website, thelandofthebible.com and become a supporter. It helps us generate more content and gives you access to our full library of video and Bible study content.